We're here at the Shangri-La Dialogue in Singapore. The major issue for the whole conference has been the competition that is heating up between the United States and China. There's a debate going on in the United States, though, about what is the goal of this competition? How far should the United States go uh, in trying to compete with China in the years ahead, this geopolitical contest that is framing our generation. We're going to speak now to Matt Turpin. Uh, he was he served in the Trump White House in the National Security Council as director from China, and he represents uh, a, a kind of a wing in this debate that is very much critical of current policy. Um, Matt, thanks for speaking to DW. So, first of all, what is the problem that you see with the current trajectory of U.S. policy towards China? Yeah, so, I mean, I think I would start with, um, you know, what we've seen from a sort of a broad base is a broad consensus across the United States that, you know, a policy that we had adopted really starting in the early 1990s and kind of culminating around 2013, 2014, of, of using engagement to drive political liberalization didn't result in the way in which we would want. We didn't see the political liberalization in China that we had wanted to see. Um, and then really from a bipartisan perspective, you've seen a re-examination of what our approach should be. Um, and really we have shifted into one of strategic competition. Uh, and that competition is now sort of, sort of baked in to U.S. policies across multiple administrations, and I don't expect that to change. And so, you know, on, on the one hand, I'm very glad to see the Biden administration continuing those things on that it really started at the end of the Obama administration, carried on through the Trump administration, um, and is likely to continue on whoever wins in November of this year. So those, to me, are the that's the that's the basic outline. The debate right now, I think, in the U.S. is what is the what is the appropriate approach to deal with this sort of common assessment that we see Beijing as a rival and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, 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 a revisionist power that is seeking to overturn the international order. Um, so how do we deal with, with China this way? And, and I think you know, the critiques that really sort of are coming out now is uh, this idea that, that we've sort of set out for ourselves a, a, a policy of, of strategic competition, one in which we are seeking uh, to, to, to contest with Beijing uh, their objectives that they're trying to achieve, and whether we're resourcing those to, to a sort of a full degree. Um, you know, we are essentially spending less now on national defense than we were in 2013, and 2013 was a, was a relatively benign international environment. We now have multiple ongoing wars, and we are spending about 2.9% of GDP on defense, a, a historic low, um, which means that given the the seriousness of the international environment that we face ourselves in, it doesn't appear that we are resourcing ourselves for that competition and for the kinds of risks that we're looking at right now. So to me, that's really the debate of are we approaching the, the problem uh, to a sufficient and serious degree uh, in ways in which nearly sort of we have broad agreement on what the, the outlines of the problem are. Yeah, so let's break it down then before we get to this question of resources and so on. So, so what are these goals of China that you think it is inherently crucial for the United States to stand up against? Yeah, so I think, you know, I mean, we could see this today in, in, in Admiral Dong's speech. Um, really, Just to say, so that's the Chinese defense minister who's been speaking here in Singapore. Yeah, so his, you know, he, this is his first Shangri-La, you know, and he gave, obviously, the, the address uh, this morning on Sunday um, uh, of really China's position uh, on international affairs and security issues. Uh, and he laid out, you know, while he used sort of the bromides of, of, of cooperation and win-win outcomes, you know, what you heard was uh, Beijing feeling that they had been victimized by an international system, that it was abusing them, and that they were going to use force to overturn that and achieve the objectives that they want to achieve. Um, and I think that what we've seen over the course of the last day and a half is a number of countries who are increasingly concerned that Beijing is acting aggressively and coercively in the region to undermine their national security interests. And they are asking the United States and Japan and European countries to help and share for collective security. And that's what we're seeing unfold. And Beijing is openly threatening um, to take military action against those those activities. Um, so that, to me, is the the 
you know, what you have is Beijing really seeking to sort of overturn this international system that we've all come to sort of depend upon for our prosperity, just as we've seen Vladimir Putin overturn the international system and use military uh, aggression and, and, and an illegal war to achieve his objectives. And just to explain to viewers like what you're referring to specifically in terms of threats of use of force. So uh, Minister Dong uh, referred to the current contest with the Philippines in the South China Sea, uh, suggesting that uh, China's patience was wearing thin, um, and also referring to Taiwan, the new leadership in Taiwan, which China calls independence forces and threatening to, uh, to uh, uh, yeah, or separatist forces and um, claiming, uh, threatening to take military action there. Um, now, you are saying that, you know, w in that context... In Japan as well. So... So you also had the Chinese ambassador to Japan also make threats against the Japanese people that if they were to support uh, what was happening in Taiwan, that they themselves would be subjected to fire as well. And so we heard, a, you know, we heard a Japanese official ask for clarification about what that meant, and we didn't get any clarification. So it's it's those levels of threat. Yeah, you know, and I think I think we also watched you know over the last two years, uh, you know, two or three years, uh, actions across the uh, Chinese Indian border. Uh, in which you have sort of aggressive actions by the Chinese uh, to claim territory that's held by India, that it's their own, and the killing of Indian soldiers, right? So you've got you've act actually military flare-ups uh, in multiple areas uh, where uh, countries are now seeing that they need really collective security outcomes to be able to get that. Um, so the United States has been uh, trying to strengthen its alliances in the region, um, in this vein, but you're saying that the, the military spend is not there to be able to help these uh, countries. Um, I mean, a lot of people around the world look at U.S. military spending and, and see the charts and just see that U.S. spending massively exceeds any other country. Um, so explain why you think that's still not enough. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, you know, the, uh, the idea of an absolute number is not sort of the appropriate measure to use here, right? Um, you know, 800 billion is not 800, you know, 800 billion of five years ago or 15 years ago. We're now seeing, you know, certainly with inflation, uh, really changes in what that money would buy. Um, you know, in terms of, of where we are two years into a Russian war uh, in Ukraine, uh, we've watched massive expansions by the Russians on, on how they're conducting military spending and how they're reorganizing their economy on a wartime footing, right? We've watched, you know, sort of high single digit, low single digit, or low double digit uh, uh, growth in Chinese defense spending over the last two decades uh, in ways in which um, while the Chinese will, will say they are spending 200 billion, right? Estimates certainly by, by experts either double that or triple that in purchasing power parity of what the Chinese can buy uh, and what their what their what the what the yuan can can purchase with what they have, right? And so I think it's a little bit misleading to sort of lay out that there is sort of this absolute number uh, and then sort of say this is what it is. So therefore, why shouldn't there be any more? Um, I mean, I think we have to put into sort of relative terms of like where we are placing money, um, where we're putting resources. Um, we're, we're at an all-time sort of low in terms of being able to sort of uh, build and repair ships. Uh, we're at an all-time low on uh, on the ability to sort of uh, recapitalize our, our forces. Uh, we've all seen the shortages of munitions. All of that requires significant resources to be able to do. And if we're essentially spending at or below what we were over a decade ago, when things were significantly more peaceful, like it really raises some real questions of, of are we matching our resources to what we see as real problems. And there are some specific areas, for instance, in terms of the Navy, the Chinese Navy is already larger in terms of number of ships than the U.S. Navy. Like, what does that mean? How, how, how concerned are you about that? Um, I mean, I'm very concerned. I mean, I think, you know, uh, we've, we've seen uh, really sort of an inability for us to be able to sort of, uh, you know, match the kinds of capabilities the Chinese have built over the last two decades. I mean, they've built a military that has been sort of purpose built to counter the United States. Some things that make me more optimistic, I think certainly Tokyo has been taking um, some incredible actions to modernize their own military and to make some serious investments in defense. We've seen this, you know, I think we're gonna hear this from, from, from Minister Kihara, the, the Japanese defense minister, um, but Japan has, I think, made some incredible 
strides in this. And so, I mean, that's important to sort of put in. I mean, I see the United States is not alone in taking these actions. And we're seeing not only Japan, but Korea and others throughout the region make significant investments in their own militaries uh, so that we can create this collective security arrangement. I think the United States needs to be doing more to help with that. Um, but but I'm also quite uh, uh, you know, proud to see other countries sort of stepping up. And I think that's the, the theme of what we're seeing here at Shangri-La. From the Chinese point of view, what this is, this, this effort by the US to boost its alliances um, is encircling uh, China. Uh, they refer to it as kind of block uh, building, Cold War mentality. What's your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I understand that that's their perspective. Um, but of course, none of these things would be happening without their aggression and coercion of their neighbors. Um, that's, that's what's driving these security dynamics. Um, you know, if they weren't water cannoning and, and ramming Philippine vessels, the Philippines would likely not be pursuing, uh, you know, uh, greater cooperation with the United States in a military aspect, right? It, it is, it is Beijing's actions that are driving these dynamics. Um, now I think Beijing refuses to sort of acknowledge their culpability in the dynamics that are happening about in the region. And then they are, you know, they are they are accusing others of causing the problems. I mean, this, this reminds me very much of, of, of Vladimir Putin, right? That it's, that it's NATO that is infringing upon him, right? And therefore he's being forced to lash out and invade other countries. When NATO had been at historic lows on its own defense spending and had been posing an increasingly low risk to Russia, right? I mean, it had been largely disarming itself for years. And, and suddenly that's the thing that is threatening to, to, to Russia. And let's just stay on the European angle for a moment, because part of the debate that's going on is about the need for the United States, some argue, massively to shift resources from Europe to Asia, for the Europeans to step up significantly in its own uh, defense yep. and helping Ukraine. Uh, what's your position on that? Yeah, I mean, this is this is the open debate in the United States. Is, you know, so given the fact that, that um, we have not made major investments in our own defense, um, you know, our resources are more thinly spread. I mean, we have obviously a major security challenge in Europe. We obviously have a major security challenge in the Middle East, and we have an existing and major security challenge in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and that is, that is stretching our resources pretty thin. Um, the United States, I think now for, you know, multiple administrations, you know, has asked its allies to share more of the burden. Um, this is where I, I really applaud Japan and the efforts they've been making you know, ever since you know, President Shin, or Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, but then through Suga and now uh, Kishida, are making, I think, important gains in their own defense spending. Um, I think you know, when I would be, I think we've, made, we've seen some NATO allies make some serious investments. Um, we need to see more of that from other partners. Um, if the United States is not able to sort of increase its own, others are going to have to carry more of that burden. And I think we're seeing that happen because they perceive the threat to be increasingly higher. Now let's come back to Asia. We've been focusing mostly so far on American allies, the Philippines, Japan, South Korea, countries that are really certainly calling for the US to take a, 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 a bigger role here. But there's another kind of grouping of countries like here in Singapore, Indonesia, other countries in this region who wish that the US and China would tone things down. They want to not get forced to pick sides in an emerging new Cold War. Um, what do you say to countries like that? I mean, I wish that we weren't in this position either, uh, but we are. I mean, I, I mean it's, it, it would it'd be spectacular to sort of wish for things that, that would be great to have happen. Um, but the reality is we're already in a new Cold War. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I think, you know, the United States, I think, has been pretty clear. We're not making demands on folks to make choices, but folks are making choices. Um, they are making their own decisions about how they're positioning themselves, how they're seeking to build better defense cooperation with their neighbors. Uh, we're seeing this in sort of bilateral and minilateral uh, partnering, even without the United States. I mean, so Japan and the Philippines, the Australia, the Philippines. Um, Japan and Australia. Uh, so we're watching this sort of across the region of multiple countries 
seeking to make themselves more interoperable and be able to cooperate more because they perceive that there is a threat. And it's, and it's not a threat of the United States seeking to take their territory. It's not the threat of the United States seeking to do these things. Beijing is doing that. That's what's driving these dynamics. Um, and I, I advocate to my Chinese colleagues that, that they need to understand what their actions are doing to the region. They're forcing the thing that they say that they don't want to have happen. They, don't, they say they don't want to be surrounded and be contained, but their actions are driving those dynamics. Now, you embrace this term, a new Cold War, that there's also been discussion about. Um, the last thing I really want to pick up on is, like, what is the goal of this new Cold War? Like, what, what is the end point that the United States should be working towards? There's one camp that is saying, manage the competition with China. Just don't let things overheat too much. There's the other camp saying the United States needs to commit to winning that Cold War just as it uh, prevailed in the last Cold War. Uh, tell us about your position there. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, first of all, I think it's important for us to recognize the situation we're in, right? And, and so I, you know, I, I have been in the past and I, you know, am, am right now clear in saying that we're in a new Cold War, right? And by Cold War, I mean that in a very sort of specific generalized term, which, which is, it's a sort of a, 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 a rivalry, a, you know, a hostile rivalry that takes place across all domains of competition yet avoids direct military conflict, right? That's, that's the definition of it, right? Um, and so I think it is, it is preferable to a hot war, right? I mean, if we're going to have a long drawn out rivalry, we should hope that it is maintained at, at a Cold War level and that there is limits on the way in which uh, the two powers interact with one another. And we don't want that to fall into direct military conflict. Um, I don't, I don't believe that Beijing wants that, and I certainly know that, that there's no one that is advocating for that in Washington. But that means being serious and realistic about the challenges that are posed. Because if you're going to seek to avoid military conflict, you're going to push the competition, you're going to push the rivalry into other domains. And that's going to be in the economic domain, it's in the technology domain, it's information, right? it's propaganda, it's ideological. And we're seeing all of those things take place. They've been taking place now for years. And I think it's important for us to recognize that dynamic. Um, and folks do make choices, right? They have understandings about what they would like to see and their own uh, path forward. And, and, and I encourage us to, to just be realistic about what we're doing rather than pretending it's not happening or pretending that this is sort of a fluke that will just go away if we ignore it. Because I don't think that's going to happen. But but you find yourself in the camp saying the U.S. has to commit to winning this new Cold War. Yeah, um, and 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 by that I mean um, you have to be serious about undertaking it. Um, I think it it's you know, the idea that you're going to sort of do this with one hand tied behind your back. Um, you're not going to make serious investments in your own defense, um, and you're going to find yourself stretched thin. It 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 opens up real um, vulnerabilities in which your, your competitor could perceive that they could use force to achieve an end, right? Because they perceive that you are not serious about doing it. And I think, I mean, we should be perfectly honest, that is what happened in February of 2022, is we had a, a set of leadership in Moscow who perceived that its adversaries were not going to fundamentally stand up against him, right? And therefore, he thought he could take the chance to achieve a military outcome. And we do not want that to happen in this region. But that's, I think, you know, when, we, when you continuously hear we don't want you know, Asia to, you know, tomorrow to be the Ukraine of, of today. I mean, that's, that's the idea, is that we don't want others to perceive that there's an opportunity to use force to achieve the objectives that they're being denied in a peaceful way. Now, just to kind of come to the core worry that some on the kind of other side of this debate have, that emphasize more managing competition with China. Um, they argue that if the goal is really defeating China in a new Cold War, that this raises the stakes for the Chinese regime, that it becomes a kind of an existential question, and that that increases the likelihood that it goes from a Cold War to a hot war that they really will be fighting. What's your response to that? The Chinese regime already views this as an existential competition. They already did. The idea that, that suddenly 
us defending ourselves and taking proper actions is going to convince them that this is not serious. I mean, Xi Jinping has been talking about this as about it being a serious competition uh, and rivalry with the United States since he made his inaugural address in January 2013, right? So this idea that somehow they're not convinced that this is existential and that, that our actions will provoke them into now believing this is serious is, I think, just a wrong analysis. They have always understood this to be the case, right? I mean, at least for a decade now. And so it's important for us to recognize those dynamics and respond because you know, my fear is not that they are provoked into conflict. My fear is that they view that they have an opportunity to win because they don't think we're prepared. That to me is the, the challenge, right? The, the cost of being underprepared and underinvested, I think, is far higher than the cost of being prepared or overprepared, right? So that's that's the, the challenge that I think we're in, um, and we need to be serious about it. And, and I'm glad to see that, that there actually are plenty of other countries, other partners, who are understanding that, and they're making their own investments. Because again, this is not the United States' sole responsibility. The American people are not expecting that we're going to do this alone. We need others to help with this, to maintain an international system that we believe in, but we do have to be serious about the situation and the risks and 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 the stakes that are that are that are at play. And what would it take for this Cold War then to end? Like, what is an end point? Um, I think you know. I mean, you know, obviously we have sort of a, you know from a traditional sense of what a Cold War is. We've got you know we have we have the example of one, right? I mean, this is the the tendency, and I and I want to separate. The capital C, capital W Cold War, i.e., the Sino or the Soviet American Cold War, from what we have now, right? There are some similarities and there are some important differences. Um, so, one, I think it's you know one of the lessons, one of the generalized lessons I would draw from this is that that Cold Wars are long and drawn out. They are they are you're essentially playing for time. Each side is playing for time, right? Each side understands that that they cannot through military force alone succeed in their rivalry with their with their adversary and so they seek to play for time and in that i think our democracies are extremely well suited because we can play for time obviously for beijing and for moscow their challenges are leadership succession their challenges are things are built around one person leadership and it's really hard to think about how their how their regimes transition when new leaders come in right and so our challenge should be how do we make ourselves strong and protect our interests and then play for the long game? Because we don't know how it will come out, right? But by putting Beijing and Moscow under pressure, right, you make it more likely that you will get a different kind of outcome than when you're seeing today. And that's 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 my advocacy. Um, you know, I am not advocating a regime change in Beijing. What I am advocating for is that we play a long game. Uh, and prepare ourselves to make sure that we are able to do this over the long term, because I think our systems work better over the long term. Um, but but an end point would presumably only come then if there were some kind of political change in China. Is that what you're ultimately saying? And that's fundamentally up to the Chinese people. It's also up to the Russian people, right? I mean, um, they are not, you know, the Russian and the Chinese people are not consigned to one type of political organization. Um, you know, they are human beings just like everyone else and can make their own choices. So um, I think we should be very clear uh, that you know, we need to be prepared to protect our own interests, make sure that you know, aggressive states that are seeking to use force to change the status quo are, are sufficiently deterred, and then play for time and allow the, 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 the inconsistencies and the pathologies of their own regimes to play out over time, right? And, and, and let the, the Chinese people and let the Russian people make their own decisions about how they want their own organization. It's not inconceivable that after Xi Jinping, you could have a collection of Chinese Communist Party leaders who say to themselves, listen, the approach that Deng Xiaoping made was a far better approach for the Chinese people and for us than what Xi Jinping took us down, right? So we could have a different outcome here. I think that's highly unlikely under Xi Jinping. It won't change under him. Like he's unlikely to change his mind, just like I think it's highly unlikely Vladimir Putin is going to change his mind. But of course, you will get new leaders at some point in time, right? They are not immortal. So we should 
We should play for that over time. And that means we need to be prepared for it to be over a long period of time. And just a final question, obviously, a lot of people are curious about what might happen if there's a Trump 2 presidency. Do you think that Donald Trump is committed to that long game as well from, from what you know from having served under him? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm not a I'm not a surrogate or, or, or a spokesperson for, for the campaign. Um, you know, certainly, I, I think, you know, he understood that that these dynamics, um, you know, uh, you know, were that we were in a we were in a sort of a rivalry dynamic and we needed to prepare ourselves. Um, I, I, I think it's difficult for me to predict what his policies would be. Um, I suspect, you know, we would see that he would view China's economic actions as being harmful to the U.S. interests and would take action there. Um, and I suspect that he would continue to welcome, as he did during his first term, you know, investments made by Japan and others, you know, in India, a partnership with India, with, with Australia. Um, he's going to continue to value those. I would, I think that that's pretty, pretty clear. Matt Tuppen, thanks for speaking to DW today. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.